start. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Konstantin Telemann from Berkeley, and he'll talk about two-dimensional and three-dimensional topological gauge theories. So please take it away. Yes, thank you very much for, oh, make sure I'm not off camera when I position myself here. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I think the title I gave was gauge theory in 2D and 3D. And I think G will be a compact group a compact Lie group, of course. You might as well assume it's connected and G check when it shows up will be the Langlands dual group. A lot of it can be understood just by looking at the case of a torus and then bringing in the vile group as a, a billionization happening in the story I'm about to tell you. So I should say this talk was inspired a bit by a beautiful lecture I saw by Matt Bullimore a few weeks ago on gauge theory, I think mostly two-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory where he explained very nicely how some constructions that we learn in uh, equivariant cohomology having to do with the Cartan model and differential forms and the Lie algebra of G uh, really are um, images of uh, constructions or operators we know in supersymmetric gauge theory. And that reminded me that uh, a long time ago when I thought about these things, there were quite a few things I thought I understood and quite a few things I didn't understand. And uh, uh, it turned out when thinking about it, I realized I lost track of, uh, of which was which. So <laughs> the past two weeks, I tried to bring back in my mind uh, uh, the things I understood, and the things I did not. And I'll try to give an account of what I think I know and maybe comments from the audience will help me understand uh, things I don't remember. So uh, for background references, there aren't too many of those, unfortunately. There's a lot of reference on gauge theory, of course, but for the story I'm telling you about, um, I long time ago, I gave some lectures in Austin, I think about, uh, they were somewhat uh, roundabout, but the notes are still available on the uh, web, I believe. I think 2011, maybe. Then uh, for more modern things, uh, uh, there's some fundamental work of uh, Bezrukovnikov, Finkelberg and Merkovich. On the Toda system. Uh, there's more recent work of, I believe, Braverman, um, Finkelberg also, Nakajima, on Coulomb branches. Oops. And so I'm, I'm citing here, you might notice the math literature because that's what the one I know well on the physics literature is enormous work on this, including on Coulomb branches, but I, I'm, I'm not, not sure I want to put names because I don't know all the names and then omission I think would probably, anything I omit would probably be worse. So uh, I'd like to tell you two points of view that I understand on two-dimensional gauged theories, which come from three-dimensional gauge theory in the topological setting and try, I think my goal in this lecture is try to reconcile them a bit because they look very different. So two points of view. On gauged PQFTs in dimension two, one of them comes from the Toda integrable system. I already mentioned that. And the other uh, comes from more basic things that, as I said, we learn in differential topology, namely the Cartan complex. And the tweak here to 
get a jump in dimension that we need, it's going to be curved, the curved Catan complex. So uh, actually, maybe the Toda story is, uh, can be explained more quickly, in, but it's very abstract, it's very hard to write examples, at least write them easily. So I'll start with the Cartan complex story, which is more elementary, but even though it takes more formulas to write things out. So let me start with part two, maybe. Oops. So the curved Cartan complex. So let's say X is a smooth manifold. Let's say G acts on X smoothly, of course. And then you have the Durham complex of differential forms to the Durham differential D. Uh, I didn't introduce a notation. G is a Lie algebra of the group G. And then, of course, the Durham complex computes the ordinary cohomology of X. And there is a complex which computes the equivariant cohomology of X. Cartan complex, which starts with. Uh, Let's use polynomials so sim of G dual times the differential forms on X. And you take G invariance everywhere and you write the Cartan differential, which is a Durham differential. The D Cartan is a Durham differential plus an extra term that captures the G action. I'll write it as psi upper A tensor um, epsilon sub. A and uh, I guess psi lower A is a basis, or maybe maybe that's instead of epsilon, that's right. Oh, let's call it epsilon. Let's call it iota of psi lower A. So psi lower A is a basis of the Lie algebra. Psi upper A is a base of G star of G dual, and iota is a contraction of differential forms. And the degree of G check, important, is two. So this operation has degree one. Forms. And an easy computation says that D Cartan squared, well, if you didn't take G invariance, is simply uh, psi A tensor the Lie derivative by the vector field generated by psi a, and of course that's zero on G invariance. And uh, of course the first example, x is a point, you compute uh, sim G check invariant under G, and that's, equivalent, uh, that's uh, isomorphic to the real cohomology of the classifying space of G or equivalent cohomology of a point, if you prefer. So I think, uh, as I said, I was very impressed by Matt's lecture a few weeks ago where some of all these operations found a place in supersymmetric gauge theory. So I think got me thinking back about that. And I don't know if this is shared by any of you, but when I, when I saw that in graduate school the first time, I was always bothered by the fact that d squared was not honestly equal to zero. It was only equal to zero on the invariant part. It always felt a bit wrong. Um, I think if I had known gauge theory at the time, which I did not, I think it wouldn't feel wrong because what we're computing here is a vector space. It's really a one dimensional gauge theory and computing invariance. And when you take invariance on a vector space, you do exactly that, you take invariant vectors. So taking G invariance is exactly the correct thing. So you don't expect anything before that. But in two dimensional gauge theory, it doesn't work like that. When you take invariance, two dimensional gauge theory, you don't just take naively take invariance. So 
maybe I do need a bit of background, which I, I'm sure everybody knows, but the slide aside, uh, local DQFTs. So in one dimensional, one dimension local DQFT generated by a vector space or a complex, so generated by a vector space. Um, if you want to gauge it under a group G, so gauging can mean two things. Uh, action of G. So V is a complex maybe on V. That's one way of doing gauge theory. Or you could mean a topological action of G on V. And topological action means G acts by its topology One way to say that is that if, the, if G had no topology, then it wouldn't act, the action would be trivial. Uh, but that both in, this means that the action must be trivializable on any part of G that is contractible, for example, neighborhood of the identity, but also, for example, the Lie algebra. So uh, one way to enforce that. So you have to interpret that. Interpretations of the Lie action, Lie algebra. The Lie, a Lie algebra is like a germ of the group. So you want to say the Lie algebra action on V carries a trivialization. And what does it mean? Well, so have the Lie, the Lie algebra action. You have a vector in the Lie algebra, it acts by a Lie derivative on V. And uh, that was a Lie action differential forms from the page above. And the trivialization uh, means an action epsilon of psi in end of degree minus one on V, a degree minus one operator with the property that its commutational differential gives a Lie action, D bracket epsilon of psi is equal to L psi. The trivialization of the action. And whenever we give the data, so of course, the second part only works if you add a complex, not just the vector space V, otherwise there wouldn't be a, uh, there wouldn't be a differential, there wouldn't be a degree minus one endomorphism. So none of those things would work. And if you look for a second, that's exactly what you have when the group G acts on a differential, on, on a smooth manifold. And you can imitate exactly this construction to take it from the Cartan complex with coefficients in the complex V, and that gives the equivariant cohomology, and that would be the space of states for the gauge theory in the case of a topological action. So it's a two versions. So it's a two versions. All right. So now let's move on to two dimensions on so two dimensional DQFT. And two-dimensional DQFTs, we know now they're generated by a category or an algebra or a differential grade category and algebra. So generated by, by a category, an algebra, a category, let's say, an algebra. And this could be differential grade, perhaps. And the Cartan complex story will work exactly in the differential grade case, differential grade. <clears throat> so to talk about gauging a theory, we want a group action, a G action actually was called G on the category, on the category. 
or as before there are two stories uh, an action of g by its topology or a topological g action that two version of the story on the same and now the first thing to notice is that so before i explain how you spell out what topological g action means what are the invariants or co-invariants in this case? What is that? Um, so I'm actually going to give the co-invariants for finite groups. It wouldn't be a diff different, but for D groups, it is different. Um, so <clears throat> if you have an algebra, it's a bit easier to write the algebra, although not necessary, uh, that has a category of modules and by invariance, you want to mean variants of the G action on the category of modules. And what are those? Those are equivariant G modules. So for A has a category of, of, G, of uh, modules. And if, if G acts on A, you have a notion of, of equivariant. A module and that's the same thing as a module of a, the cross product algebra where alpha is the action i'm not going to define the cross product algebra in fact you, you have to we'll see in a second you have to be a little careful and the fixed point category within the category of modules of the g cross a so fixed point category this and they generate the gauge theory right so we don't do what we in the case of a vector space of taking the invariant part of a you could do that but that would not give you the correct gauge theory um so now, if G is a finite group, by the way, then all these notions are key, and there's no distinction between a, a G action, the topological G action, because they just say a G act. But uh, now I have to explain a bit what does topological G action mean. So what does it mean? So we want to trivialize. G action contractible uncontractable subsets of G. You have to find there's more than one way to make it precise, but here's one of them. So you have to think what uh, replaces the endomorphism of a vector space in the case of an algebra. So this in this categorification process. So uh, you had V and you had the endomorphism of V, which is a differential grade algebra. For an algebra A or a category C, you have the Hochschild cohomology of A, which has, a, which is a Gerstenhaber algebra. It can be made into differential grade Gerstenhaber algebra. And that means differential grade algebra but it also has a Lie bracket of degree minus one. So it is DGA plus Lie bracket uh, compatible differential negative one. So HH one of A is the uh, non-S Lie algebra of the derivations of A. So maps from A to A satisfying the Leibniz rule, and it has a Libra, naturally the algebra. For the other cohomologies, a bracket, of course, moves you to a different degree. So that's what replaces the endomorphism. 
and uh, use a differential version of uh, of the story so we can couple the Cartan complex I have to assume that I've produced an actual differential grade I mean I produce the Hochschild cohomology in this form. If you read uh, the textbook, the standard way of producing the Hochschild cohomology comes from the bar complex, and it takes some manipulations to get into this form that works in characteristic zero, in fact. So it is a characteristic zero story if people care about such things. All right, so now, what does a topological action mean? So topological. Oops. And topological, I should really mean topological, differential topological action, because I'm using derivatives everywhere. Certainly you want G acts by smoothly by automorphisms of the category of the algebra. I'm not going to define that there are ways to do so by automorphism. of the algebra A. And you like the algebra to generate by infinitesimal automorphism. So this action, sorry, not the algebra. So the action generated by infinitesimal automorphism. And we know the infinitesimal automorphism. They come from Hochschild cohomology. So we have the Lie algebra G and you want a Lie algebra map to the Hochschild co-cycles, one co-cycle, Hochschild one co-cycle. Okay. That's the analog of asking that of a Lie algebra map from the Lie algebra G to endomorphism. And now I want to trivialize this action as well to make it topological. So this was degree zero, so Lee degree zero. This happens Lee degree zero. Now we're going to Lee degree minus one. And we're writing a differential here, which is just the equality. And I want to kill this action. So I have to supply a map epsilon to Hochschild zero co-chains. And here is a Hochschild differential. So that's a very, very strict way of imposing the condition. Now, if you have a bit of experience with the uh, differential things or topology, you know it's a bit too strict. So there's actually a, a softening of this condition. So as an aside. Constantine, why was the Lie algebra graded? Lie algebra was not, G was not graded. I'm Creating oh. now a differential grade Lie algebra with G in degree zero, the usual bracket, G in degree minus one, the zero bracket, but of course the action of degree zero and degree minus one. And I'm asking that L extends to the, I didn't ask it correctly, so it make me jump ahead, but that's okay, uh, extends to the DGLA map from this complex, this DGLA here, to the Hochschild complex. Oh, I see. So it's epsilon that has degree minus one and G has degree no, one. No, epsilon has degrees. Well, no, because this G is in degree minus one. This is a complex with G in degree minus one, G in degree zero. Oh, I see. I see. I see. And this complex, the fact that the action L extends to an action of this complex tells you that the action is to L is trivial. That is a trivialization of it. Trivialization of L. That is a trivialization of this diagram. Okay. I'll give some examples in a second. Uh, but uh, before I do that, I'll make a comment because that will become relevant late, maybe not right away, but later. Namely, we've asked too much. So remark of the condition. We've asked for too much. Now, asking for a, when you have a Lie group, asking for an honest action as opposed to an action up to homotopy of something is completely reasonable. In fact, without that, we can probably not do 
much about gauge theory, only doing homotopy theory. So anything that's more subtle than that will probably escape if you don't ask for the action of the compact group to be a, a strict action whenever, whenever it can be. But the, a trivialization of the action uh, is now a homotopical notion. And here I've written something very strict. So this has to be, epsilon has to be kind of up to hom coherent homotopies to all orders. So epsilon should not be strict. Oops. But only defined up to coherent homotopies to all orders. And in the world of Lie algebra as a way to make this precise, I will not say very much, except uh, what you want is this whole thing. So DGLA map, so let me write in red, so that the, the DGLA map should be an L infinity map. below the original action L, which you want to keep strict. So what it means in effect that epsilon is not, doesn't have to be a linear map here. It has to be an, any map in fact, the power series or polynomial, the Hochschild cohomology, uh, and it's either satisfied an infinity condition, which I will not write down, but, uh, uh, Actually, I can write it down. So in fact, epsilon, epsilon may extend to uh, a map. Um, let's try it this way. To a collection of maps. Because there's the condition on the degree. Sim uh, N of G to H H negative two N of uh, no two N minus plus two I guess of A. It turns out that's a correct grading. If I didn't make a mistake, zero here goes to zero and higher degree things map to degree minus two minus four and so on. So in other words. Uh, you could say a graded map from G placed in degree minus two to the Hochschild cohomology of A. Uh, actually, it's a co-chain, it's not com it's only wrote cohomology. But uh, it's almost maps to cohomology. The only failure of mapping to cohomology is that this differential hits the map from G to HZ1. So what we remember is that we have a polynomial function on G with values in HH even allowed. And it is almost Close, so it's almost a co cycle. I probably won't explain what, what changes as on the co cycle. And because this algebra was a billion, it also must self bracket to zero. So no self bracket. Now, one place where physics differs from homotopy theory is that. Uh, the grading collapses mod two. We have bosons and fermions, but we don't usually grade beyond that. So in, in examples, in interesting examples, the grading is collapsed mod two. So when the grading is collapsed mod two HH odd of an algebra or category gives you infinitesimal 
automorphism or obstructions. And HH even gives you, give you deformations. And so something very interesting shows up is that just from asking and have a group action on the algebra, which is topological, you suddenly get a family of a deformation of the original algebra living over the Lie algebra G. So, so datum. gives a family of categories, algebras, as let's say maybe A sub psi, leaving over my handwriting is degenerating. I'm really sorry, I have to slow down. And it's of course equivariant under the group action. It's on the conjugation action in G, so equivariant for the group action. No. All right, so I've given you a datum of what it means for a, um, for a group to act topological or an algebra or a category. And now I better do something with that. I mean, I want to produce a gauged category. So now next, given this datum, and here I've just shown the datum actually contains highly non-trivial information in general. But given this datum, I want to produce the gauged algebra. category. And the complex that gives that is a curved Cartan complex. And so the answer is given by the CCC. And it looks very much like the original Cartan complex, except you do what you're supposed to do and taking invariance. So instead of taking invariance, take algebra invariance. The curved Cartan complex is the group G cross product with respect to the action with the algebra A, let's say it was an algebra, not a category, times sim of G check. The differential is uh, the original differential on A, it was a DGA, plus um, Um, sorry, I'm just getting myself confused. It's going to be psi A. Oops. Psi A times Let, let me write it this way, epsilon of psi A as before. In the case it was linear, otherwise there are higher, higher operations. If epsilon is linear, I'm not going to write it. And with, in addition to, well, as you know, from taking the example of a differential form on a manifold, D doesn't square to zero, which sounds like a problem. So there's an extra term, I call it W, and that term is psi A tensor psi lower A of delta one. And this delta one is a delta function on G at one. So psi of delta one is a derivative of delta function, uh, the algebra direction psi lower A. And, uh, and uh, psi upper A is of course the element in sim GR. And this is the super potential. And the little theorem, I've only, as written, it's only correct in the, the case where epsilon was a linear map, is that this is a curved algebra. Okay. Proposition theorem. That's one, maybe, and two, the category of more curved modules over it is the gauged version of A modules. So topologically gauged. So. Okay. 
gauged category of uh, A modules is uh, the category of modules of the curve Cartan complex. The CCC. Okay, so I'm not going to do any calculations here. I should point out that when, in the case above, when, when, when epsilon is not just a linear map, where was it? Here, when there are higher polynomial terms, they come up as higher infinity operations in this algebra. They have to be included to get a curved algebra. So, um, Jane, could you explain a little more about how the super potential is? Yes, yeah, so the, the condition, so the condition of a curved algebra is that d squared should be commutation with a super potential. Let's see if we if I wrote that a long time ago in the Cartan complex. Uh, yes, d Cartan square is xi a coupled with the Lie action of the Lie algebra element xi a. Okay, yes, that's and the where are we? And this is a now. Uh, an infinitesimal group element, that's a Lie algebra element, a derivative of a delta function of one at, of a delta function at one in the xi direction. So its commutation action is exactly the Lie algebra action. Um, in what sense is it a super potential? Is there some n equals two here? Or I'm, I'm uh, not sure I, why you call I, it. I, a I super don't feel potential. qualified to answer such questions. I'm sorry. It's a super potential in the sense that this is a curved DGA. In that sense, the super potential. If, if you were to write, if there are higher infinity operations to write them all, then the total operation, including W, is going to be a curved DGA. But let's write, let maybe, let's do a few examples. And you might actually, uh, let's see actually if I'm going to spell it out in any example, the calculation. I'm, I might not, I might just tell you what the answers are because time is pressing. Curve DG algebra. So let's do some examples. Um, uh, so maybe actually, by the way, one of the examples, you really see a super potential there when I make some changes. So let's take uh, one A, the universal enveloping algebra of G with G acting by conjugation. And then the Cartan complex will have G acting on the UG tensor SG star with a, with a uh, oh yeah, so let's explain the datum, sorry. So uh, uh, L, so G maps to derivation of u of g simply by the bracket so psi maps to commutation of psi and epsilon is a map from g to the Hochschild zero co-chains of the algebra you can just take the algebra and the map is the obvious map psi maps to psi that's the identity map So the superpotential, so in this case, you'd have a superpotential. Instead of a differential, u of g, you know, this is not graded. So you have a superpotential, uh, which is uh, psi a in g star. Sorry, I use g star, but check. Tensor psi lower a in u of g. And there's another superpotential, which is, uh, Psi A tensor psi, psi lower A of delta Y. And the calculation, we have to do the calculation here. You can sort of guess it, guess it because if you know a little bit about curved algebras, this is a non-degenerate quadratic map on G plus G check. 
is like the form x y in two dimensions and that superpotential kind of kills x the category you just keep the critical point so the answer is the calculation gives that this to be equivalent to be so curved modules over the thing inside are going to be uh, just vector spaces and now you're taking the cross product of g with a category c or oh, sorry with the algebra c or the, the invariance of g in vector spaces so the category you get is web g and it's a calculation you can do um, another example is a slightly more convincing example maybe if instead of u of g you take a you could uh, some people love it some people hate it they're closely relating d modules on g if you don't like d modules you prefer local systems you can take the derived category of local systems on g you'll get the same answer um ccc computes the category back in this case so in other words take the category of local systems on g so g acts by translation i didn't see g acts by translation then gauging that topologically well kills the space g is like looking at the space g dividing by g you get a point so it matches the intuition g mod g equals point so in some way the category of local systems over g is like the categorical regular representation of a topological group g so if you want to take away so um so local systems of G with translation action is a regular regular categorical representation or regular representation of G in categories. Um, I could give one a few more examples let's skip that one let me give a so i don't go rush too much in the last thing i want to say let's let's so third example is going to be a point Um, it's easier to do the computation in the abelian case, but uh, it's true in non abelian case. On so the abelian case, the conclusion is true. So, what do we have? We have G cross product with the space of uh, uh, functions on the Lie algebra, sin G check, and the superpotential is. Uh, Psi, the linear function psi a coupled with the derivative of delta function so let's spell it out as i said it's easier and g is a torus and the lambda be the character lattice then what's a group ring of g under convolution so a group ring under convolution what so why is it easier because the action is trivial first of all and second it's very easy to write a grouping under convolution so this algebra becomes then a direct sum over the weights well just one cb endomorphism of the representation as just c times functions on teach on g check so it's a direct function of this of uh, sim of g check g is a billion the component labeled by lambda what is w well w is well the action of the element psi on the representation lambda in this case the superpotential is a linear function on the sheet lambda
That's what this becomes. When you break it up. Because psi of delta one of one acts as lambda pair with psi. Well, what's the category of curved modules on affine space on a vector space G with a linear superpotential? Well, that's actually known. The category of curved modules is always supported on the critical locus of the superpotential. When lambda is not zero, is no critical locus. So all the sheet except the zero sheet vanish. So the category is, is that of SIMG check modules. And this is, of course, in this case, called the cohomology of B of G. This is the abelian case. So the conclusion holds for any G, but you have to do a, the, the computation is a bit less obvious, of course. You have to do a calculation to see that. So you get what you expected. You expect the modules over the cohomology of BG as by, by from gauging a point. But now let's make it more interesting. Or a point. But now let's add by hand the superpotential. So I'm not sure if that will answer uh, um, Greg's question, but uh, it might look more like a superpotential. So the superpotential will be added to the, the space uh, G, so to, to the algebra sim G check. I'll add the term in there. And I can add any central, ele any central element I want in the algebra superpotential. So the superpotential will send psi to simply psi squared, the invariant quadratic form. And let's compute the category we get, compute the gauge category. And in the abelian case, again, again, the calculus, I mean, uh, it's a paper by Fried and myself that does it in general in 2015. For general G, I can do the calculation now. Uh, so let's do the abelian case. The space as before is a disjoint union over the weights of copies of the Lie algebra. Sorry, I'm calling it G not T, even though it's a torus, G lambda. And the superpotential W lambda is what the linear part from before, psi goes to lambda of psi plus psi squared. And now surprise, there's a critical point on every sheet, exactly one. So now the category we get has one, one copy of vect for each character of the torus and in general, so in general the theorem is the category is, is rep of G and each representation is supported on where it's supposed to be on the coadjoint orbit of its way. So each representation on the coadjoint orbit. of its weight. And this is topological young mills theory in two dimensions. And um, okay, we're getting short on time, but let me just uh, four prime. I mean, if you, if you like this one, you love the next example, you can add more general functions of invariant functions of size superpotentials.
invariant. <clears throat> what are functions of psi? They are cohomology classes on BG. So let's correspond to classes in cohomology of BG. So the degree of the the, poly, the degree of the monomial is uh, is half of the degree of the cohomology class. So the quadratic form corresponding to H four. So psi squared corresponds generator of H four. Now such classes transgress to classes H even minus two from BG on the moduli space of G bundles on the Riemann surface for any sigma. And they give rise to two dimensional TQFT from invariants obtained by integrating these classes from integrals of these classes. as invariants, as top level invariants. And so a two dimensional DQFT is controlled among other things by Frobenius algebra. Controls these. So Frobenius algebra controls this. And the theorem is that the Frobenius algebra is a Jacobian ring of the superpotential you've started with. This Frobenius algebra. Is the Jacobian ring. Of. So let's. Uh, of W such classes W. In other words, the integrals of a class is obtained from W on moduli space of G bundles on a Riemann surface can be computed from a Frobenius algebra of a superpotential. This is, of course, going to be a reformulation of Witten's 1992 paper. It's the reformulation of But uh, the correct way to say it now is that this is the mirror of gauge theory of a point deformed by the superpotential W. So that today would say that. Of pure gauge theory of a point. Deformed by the superpotential W. So I don't know if that uh, helps the notion of superpotential, because on the gauge theory side, you just put in a cohomology class which you're going to use to integrate. But on, on this side, we're doing a matrix factorization calculation of the kind you see on the B side of mirror symmetry. And that's exactly what this is. Uh, looks like my timing was very bad. So um, the TODA system will happen in five minutes. And uh, I don't know how clear uh, the connection, the curved Cartan complex will be, uh, except by means of an example. So this was uh, part two, be a And let me give you a few slogans first. Um, slogans, which are very precise, actually can be made precise, it just won't have time. So the symmetry is, of a theory in any dimension of a TQFT, say, or a QFT in 2D are captured by a 3D theory with the original TQFT as a boundary condition. Boundary condition. 
So EG, gaugeable two-dimensional theories, we're talking about gauge in two dimensions, are boundary theories for pure to three-dimensional gauge theories. So gaugeable, gaugeable 2D theories. Conditions for uh, 3D topological gauge theory. Um, <clears throat> now, when you have a story like this with the 3D theory and the 2D theory, let me draw, let me draw a bit more nicely. You have a plane here, and then you have a half space on this side. And what you can have point operators and the, on the boundary. On the boundary. And you can have point operators in the bulk. There are some mathematical names going with the, with the relations that they obey. I and mean, the relations are obvious when you draw the picture. These guys, these blue guys can move inside the space and can also migrate to the boundary if they choose. The red ones are frozen on the boundary. So what you would say that the point operators here, they form an E2 algebra. The blue guys form an E3 algebra. Three is a dimension, of course. And there's a notion of an E2 algebra being an algebra over an E3 algebra, and it means exactly what the picture says, that all the, you can move things around subject to these rules I just told you, and they're well-defined composition. Now, what are the point operators in pure gauge theory? And the point operators are determined by the link of a point, oops, I have two minutes, which is a sphere. So this is going to be the homology of the space of maps from S2 into BG. It's all topology, which is homology, equivariant homology of omega g. The point operators of the theory on the boundary, well, when it's, a, when it's on the boundary of gauge, if it was as a standalone theory, the point operators would form the Hochschild homology or cohomology, let's be, let's be generous, uh, Hochschild cohomology of the algebra A. But when it's on the boundary of ga the gauge theory, Turns out you have to use the equivariant Hochschild cohomology. So the what you derive from this picture is that this is an E2 algebra over the E3 algebra and I can just say a quick conclude one sentence conclusion is that so the theorem I studied the authors Bezrukovnikov, Finkelberg, and Merkovich, is that spec of the covariant homology of omega g, the base loop space of g, is the total space of the Toda integrable system you have spec of the equivariant cohomology of a point sitting below it, and that is, of course, the Lie algebra uh, mod, the adjoint action of G, or if you like, the Cartan mod, the Weil group, and that is the integrable system structure. And that's one. Then the E3 structure is determined by the symplectic structure on the total system. On this guy. And the algebra structure, so the, let's just write, the covariant cohomology of uh, the algebra A, or spec of that I should write, in geometrically, is a subvariety of the total system.
which is Lagrangian. I should write subject. I, I can't explain that subject to some mild conditions. Subject to some conditions, maybe not so mild. And as a result, obviously the category, the original category. So here's the picture. I can I'm over time, but I'll just draw this picture. So you have a base of a total system, which is like T mod W. You have the zero in here. Over the zero fiber, you have the original category of A modules. So it lives somewhere on the zero fiber. And over a general point psi, you have the psi deformation of the category that appears in setting up the trivialization of the G action on A at which feeds into the curved Cartan complex of the category, which appeared in the trivialization. of the G action, not the G action, the topological G action on, uh, on A. And uh, I think my plan was to explain this, but I obviously won't get there. The calculation, the curved Cartan complex calculation can be reinterpreted as the calculus inside this total space of a TODA system, uh, calculus involving intersection of Lagrangian varieties. And I'll stop here. Sorry, I went over time. So calculus, so CCC calculus can be geometrically interpreted here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Let's thank Constantine, you can talk virtually or in real, uh, but unmuting yourself. And um, are there any questions? Please just raise your hand and mute yourself then. I'm sort of a maybe naive question. In your picture on the uh, page before, um, if we could just go back to that. So in physics, you would probably say that the, the, the local operators aren't just coming from point operators in this bulk, but also from line operators that could end there. So I don't know whether this is the thing in your, your formula. Uh, there are line operators. And of course, instead of, uh, of uh, um, S2, you'd have to put an S1, you have to put the link. And then you're looking at a covariant cohomology instead of omega G, what is this? Instead of this, you would look at G inside with a conjugation action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, so they're a little less useful geometrically because mm -hmm. the cohomology of G is purely nil potent and exterior algebra. So it's pretty hard to picture, but yes, they are there, but mm -hmm. turns out they can be reconstructed from the information I've given. So there's mm -hmm. something, like, something like a Zul duality that allows you to sure. play, to, 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 to go between BG and G. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's these guys which carry geometric information and the others don't, can't because they're nilpotent in this, ca in this case. Okay, thanks. Greg, you have a question, please. Yeah, Constantine, could you go back to example four in part one about topological Yang Mills? Four in part one, yes. So topological Yang Mills in the space for the circle is uh, uh, the space of one line for each uh, irreducible representation. This is the class functions on the group. Right. And that's the space you're going to get here because the category is semi-simple with exactly one copy of vector with each representation. Yes, exactly. So, um, but G here is is a continuous Lie group, right? Yes. Um, so that's, I, I'm what, maybe I don't understand what you mean by topological young mills. Uh, because I would have thought that um, I always thought that that it, in that case it's only a partially defined topological theory because that's correct. Most of them are, are yes, uh, that, 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 that is correct, and that's because that's because there are infinitely many representations. 
Exactly. So, so you're, I thought you were, I mean, so you weren't exactly talking about topological filters. Well, I was talking about topological field theories in the sense that do not depend on a metric or another structure on the manifold, but no, not that they're fully defined in all dimensions. By the okay, way, there's a way, there's a way to make it finite. In a, uh, the good way to make it finite is to replace it by K theories. I mean, what makes it infinite is that we've, we've made it cohomological. Oh, That's okay. Great. I would have said the good way to make it finite is to introduce an area element. <laughs> uh, yeah, but then that's, that's definitely not topological. When right. If you pass, if you pass yeah. to K theory, then it's still topological. And now it's finite yeah. because there are finitely many representations of a loop loop. And oh, OK, OK. Because, I mean, let's see. I mean, you were using the notions of fully extended topological field theory. Yeah. So I was assuming it was a totally defined one. But this applies, I guess the lesson here is that it applies to only so things that are, some things actually, apply to partially defined theory. So, for example, I talk about topological gauge in three dimensions. That's also not a fully defined theory. You cannot right. define invariants there. But enough is defined. It makes sense to talk about two-dimensional boundary theories for it, for example. Okay. okay. Some operations are defined. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I just have kind of a... a Big question I've wondered for a while that, that you presented uh, this example here that's on the screen, or maybe the next one is sort of a, a mirror calculation um, in terms of describing something in terms of a super potential. My understanding of 2D mirror symmetry, sort of traditional mirror symmetry, is always that it has to do with kind of dualizing torus vibrations. Uh, is there a way to say kind of what's the geometry that's underlying the kind of mirror duality or picture? Well, I think if you have toric varieties, yes, and then you, then you can do it exactly that way. But if, it, if you start with something where you don't have a torus vibration, how would you, how would you describe? I mean, yes. I, right, that's kind of my question. Yeah, so I mean, I think if in the original mirror symmetry, I think the, well, I, I would have to tell you more about the Toda system here, but uh, in the case, if G is a torus, what was it? then this space is going to be the cotangent bundle of the dual torus. And when you write the uh, equivalent quantum cohomology of your uh, toric variety, you're going to produce a map from the mirror variety to dual torus. And sometimes the mirror is a dual torus, the superpotential. So you recover the original Batire results that way. It's sort of become a very special case for this in the Abelian case. But I mean, it, it's a little funny because uh, to, to see it that way, you, you're not using the Toda integrable system projection. You're using the other projection to conjugate cyclic of the group. So that would be uh, to, to see the mirror. So, and actually, right. they, oh, they like, I like somewhere. I probably forgot the Langdon's duel, didn't I? Because I was rushing. I think <laughs> on this page, I think so this is correct, but to the integrable system for G check. Well, I haven't actually used anything about that yet. So nothing is literally wrong, but that's what I think. So this is closely related to the cotangent co bundle of the dual, Langland's dual group modular conjugation, this Toda space. And that's where the mirror is. So that's, the mirror does involve Langland's dual group. Are there any other questions? Maybe one more question. So, because Greg was emphasizing this too, you focus always on on Lie algebra and Lie groups. But uh, if you actually apply this to uh, discrete groups or binary groups, this all becomes a trivial story, or there's something interesting there. Uh, well, yes, there's no real Langlands dual of a finite yes. group, I think. So. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, the, the first part of your story that you could... Yeah, you, you see, almost everything that was interesting yeah. in what I said had to do with the infinitesimal yeah. action of the group. So once you erase that, that, it just becomes, uh, yeah. that, that disappears. Yeah. So the... 
Because that sort of Olsen physics is an interesting thing to look at. That this creates yeah, yeah. So actually, things. some things. Uh, in that case, actually, your other question becomes uh, a little yeah, the more to the point. The one you just asked about the other operators, because oh, where is my thing? Because of omega g when g is a finite group is not interesting at all, whereas g is. Yes. In the, in the other situation, yes, hg of g mm -hmm. is the interesting thing to look at. That's part because it has more operators than just the equivariant cohomology of g. It has a twisted mm -hmm. sectors. So I think what I said that you can recover the other one by looking here is only to for connected groups. It's mm -hmm. the complement of what you right. uh, what you ask uh, what you're asking now. So th thank you for the correction. That's correct. If you if you, if G is disconnect, you'll need this and the line operators to catch the other components. I think that's correct to catch everything. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. Let's thank Constantine again, and then we'll stop the recording.